Let's continue this conversation by opening questions to the floor. But perhaps, um, first let me pose this question to both of you. Um, while Hong Kong has long been known as the shopping mecca, how do you think the lifestyle scene has evolved in light of the surge in interest in art here in Hong Kong? Um, I think a lot of um, more innovative concepts has been in Hong Kong for, the, for these past few years. If you see it's from restaurants and F&B concepts, that's been from interior-wise to um, the idea of artisanal gastronomy kind of concepts or little bistro or mom and pop kind of concepts are thriving because there's actually more entrepreneurship coming up in, in Hong Kong. First, from, from domestic uh, um, you know, uh, new generations or from expats who are coming from Europe and from US who's actually living in Hong Kong. There are more expats who live in Hong Kong than before. Uh, and they are bringing a lot of new ideas from abroad um, and they're collaborating with a lot of local players in order to create a lot of new, new concepts. So what I can try to say is that Hong Kong has become very um, more global, actually, in um, lifestyle concepts. Retail-wise, I think I think F and B and and is very obvious. You can it's very obvious in Hong Kong. Retail-wise, I think um, I think it's slowly picking up. You're seeing a lot of um, very artisanal kind of tailor-made kind of concepts um, that is in very secretive um, places, uh, and there, this is actually thriving as well. Um, and I think it's good. I think that um, the scene is it's growing. And as Alan was saying about our Basel and other incubators that are making more people to come to Hong Kong and living in Hong Kong and you know creating their own uh, endeavor in Hong Kong. Yeah. Do you think uh, the rise of Hong Kong um, as the third largest, world's third largest art market, has something to contribute to this? general interest in the community for art, would you say? I think it does um, create some kind of momentum. But uh, art, art fairs are actually a trading platform. So the people who come to, to Hong Kong may only stay for like a week. But it does moment, give this momentum and give this um, kind of, um, how do you say, um, it's, it's not an incubation. It, it does incubate for people to create their own business in art and lifestyle. But I think the most importantly is that Hong Kong needs to also grow their own ecosystem, which the ecosystems is not only just creativity or innovation, but also um, it does, you know, you have to op they, have, they have to open in the right area with the right rental space. Uh, and you need a lot of support from, from, from the community. Uh, but what I see from my projects, from K11, is that um, the new generation are extremely curious and creative, and they're very, very willing to experiment and um, explore a lot of new uh, creative items. Uh, and they want to be special. They want to be limited edition. They want a lot of limited edition. They, they, they can afford it, but... Uh, and they're willing to to see uh, to explore new kind of horizons. You're yeah. referring to consumers or consumers, the, the yes, consumers. Yes, yes. Any yeah. thoughts, Alan, about this phenomenon happening? Uh, well, no. I mean, clearly, I think um, uh, you know the development of uh, uh, the auctions as well as the shows has uh, you know really propelled Hong Kong into the into the foreground of uh, the, the sort of global markets. Um, uh, but as I said, I think um, you know a lot more needs to be done in terms of creating you know, a, a, a permanent home, you know, the, the uh, M50 or the museum projects um, and, uh, and, and beyond. Um, and it still amazes me that you know, Hong Kong, I think, sells itself very well in a lot of places. But you know, I still have colleagues who come from, and friends who come from overseas who only see basically central and Tsim Sa Choi and think that's all that Hong Kong is about. And then if you take them up to you know, Sai Kung or to some of the parks and, and uh, the trails that we have, they're amazed. I mean, people who've even been here for maybe 10 years uh, still see, don't know that there are aspects of, uh, of, of Hong Kong beyond just, I mean, you know, the, the, the of course, uh, excellent platform that we have for, for doing business and doing trade. But um, 
maybe there's, there's some thought that needs to go into how we can really showcase you know, the, the, the entire spectrum of uh, what Hong Kong has to offer. Okay. Do we have any questions on the, from the floor so far? Yes. I'll bring a mic over. Thank you. So I think the, uh, the question probably is directed to K11. So what is your target group? Of course, age-wise, there'll be 25 and 45, the younger generations. But are we talking about the younger generations of Hong Kong or the younger generations of China, where you introduce the Western art form to them? Or you're trying just to provide them with a platform that they'll be able then to, in, to, to, to go into more innovations to create their own art. And also that center of it will be the culture or the art of Hong Kong or very much the Western style of art. Our focus group is 25 to 45, but what we see is that it's basically a lot of them are early 30s and mid 30s. That's our median age. We target the new generation because with the new generations are actually very hungry, especially in China, about culture. They're very curious uh, about art. And, and so we do a lot of interaction with them. So it's not just one way, it's actually mutual. So we have workshops, we have seminars, but at the same time, they also cre they can do art jamming, they can create their own uh, dialogue with people and they can create their own art as well. Hong Kong is, as I said, focused a lot on, de uh, more on design and university um, art graduates because we want to incubate uh, that part to, our, our, uh, to, to, to give them more exposure to the mass. For China, we focus on um, contemporary art with a focus of Chinese contemporary artists. Uh, Hong Kong, we focus on contemporary Hong Kong artists, especially the university graduates from the art schools and, and, and so forth. But we also do have group shows too. For example, as I mentioned, um, the Palais de Tokyo Museum show, um, it has a very big focus on the young Chinese artists, which is called a YCA phenomenon. Uh, but also, we have two to three French artists, so we're also building a platform that we're doing a group show, so that in Hong Kong, people are able to, to know who their artists are, but at the same time, um, it becomes a, a more global kind of um, expo uh, platform. Yeah. Would you say um, K11 attracts a certain type of clientele? Are you, are you targeting any particular? It, it, it does. I think it does um, attracts well, it attracts VIPs, of course, because of our price point, right? But uh, aside from that, there are people who are more sophisticated, uh, they're very cultural, or they're very hungry for looking at, to understand more about the art and culture. Because in China, sometimes they don't have um, a outlet to, to, to see, for, to see an access to a certain, like, they've never seen a Monet painting. They have not, they have not even, under, they, they don't know about Impressionism but they want to know more, but they don't know where. You know? So it's, this process is very important. And, and Impressionism was very influential in the contemporary young Chinese artists. So we also created conferences for these Chinese young artists uh, and kids to know more about Impressionism and really see the real, the real painting. So I think there's a lot of um, dialogue. And, the, and, and I, as I said, because of the traffic, the number of people that's in this space, we're able to really have an economies of scale. Um, so it, yes, it does uh, attract, not a niche, but you would be surprised that there's a lot of people who are cultured or who wants to know more about culture, who is trying to, to explore about uh, our culture. And this process is important because um, it's really giving them a chance to, uh, um, to improve um, or to know more. It's, a no, it's more like a knowledge increasing the knowledge about certain uh, art and culture phenomena. Any other questions? Perhaps we can um, switch gears slightly. Um, since both of you are in the lifestyle business, how do you think um, are Asia's high-end consumers different from the West, or are they? Alan, would you like to take the first? Oh. Well, I, I think um, 
as I said, uh, you know, um, Art Basel Hong Kong has become an international uh, uh, event, and we see from also events around the world that, you know, that uh, audience is now, I mean, truly global. Um, so, you know, we have obviously clients from Asia traveling uh, frequently to to Europe and to the U.S. and, and vice versa. So, um, I think uh, if Hong Kong has these type of world-class events, it attracts a world-class audience. Um, so yes, I think uh, today it, it is, you know, we are truly in a global market. Now you had mentioned that um, Richemont acquired Shanghai Tang, um, which is somewhat different from your more French-centric line of brands. What was the thinking behind it? I wasn't here at the time, they were, but uh, I mean, clearly they saw something uh, quite unique about, you know, Shanghai Tang. Uh, creating a really a, a you know a lifestyle brand here in Asia, um, and now the brand has gone through you know a uh, evolution. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, I mean we're actually now opening more stores uh, in China uh, than the rest of the world. And I think through um, you know the development of the collections really paying homage to, you know, Chinese craftsmanship, et cetera, um, that is now appealing to, you know, to more of a domestic market. So uh, it's, it's interesting to see how this, uh, this brand uh, continues to evolve. We've just um, celebrated the 20th anniversary uh, of, uh, of uh, Shanghai Tang and uh, held an event in, in Shanghai. Um, and uh, it was interesting, again, to see, um, you know, the, the, the profile of customers who today you know, wear Shanghai Tang uh, regularly. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of talk about you know, uh, uh, China and Hong Kong developing uh, global brands. Um, and Shanghai Tang is often used as uh, an example of an aspiring global brand. Maybe we're not quite there yet, but uh, certainly, you know, the foundation stones are being laid uh, every day. Um, my question is to Alan, okay? Uh, since you said that, you know, Richmond Group, you know, you have 40% of your business in China and, and in Hong Kong. Um, now, with uh, this policy of this uh, anti-corruption in China, how does that affect, you know, the luxury market? And also in Hong Kong with this um, Occupation Central movement, you know, would that be affecting Hong Kong too? And what would, you know, the, as, as luxury market-wise, okay, what would be the strategy? Would you be still expanding into this part of the world? Or would you talk about globally, you know, into other parts of, um, of the world? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm glad we have an easy question to do. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, clearly the, the uh, uh, anti-extravagance or, or the uh, um, uh, gifting uh, policy has, has had an impact. But again, uh, you know, I think it's easy to generalize. And I mean, certain brands that have been developing in this part of the world, even globally, uh, you know, came in quite recently and were never really part of that whole uh, gifting culture. Um, maybe, you know, the first wave, you know, some people talk about first mover advantage, but uh, maybe we're now living through a, an era of actually first mover disadvantage where, you know, if you've been here for a long time and a lot of that business was linked to uh, some of that gifting, then it's been impacted more than others. But actually, if you look at the results, I mean, we had just posted our six month uh, first half results and uh, you know, we had 8% growth uh, globally. Um, this region was, uh, was flat, uh, but um, you know, the, the business today is, is much more founded on the growing uh, aspirational class, as well as uh, you know our traditional, uh, you know high end, high net worth uh, customers. Um, so I don't deny it has had an impact in varying degrees uh, to various brands. Um, but uh, overall, I think if you look at uh, you know quite a few of the luxury groups and, and luxury brands are still in a pretty healthy state. And what's been happening in Hong Kong, I think is really just a continuation, unfortunately, of um, a trend that we've seen for, for the last year or so. Um, and uh, it may be linked to many, many reasons, but I think also because um, 
uh, you know, people as they have more disposable income, um, they want to travel further afield, they want to see new places. Um, so again, Hong Kong needs to, and Hong Kong will, because you know, Hong Kong always does, uh, adapt and find ways to now uh, bring some of those people back. Uh, and uh, I think you know, what Adrian is doing with, uh, with his projects, um, again, what, uh, you know, what, what uh, Art Hong, uh, hopefully uh, uh, the West Kowloon Cultural uh, Hub, when, when it finally sees a day of light, will uh, hopefully you know, make Hong Kong a more attractive place for people to keep coming back. But I think it's just something that you know, we have to accept is, is uh, you know, we have these cycles where, uh, again, Hong Kong, by, by virtue of our geographical location and so on, uh, had, I mean, you know, the, the first wave and, and uh, you know, tremendous success. Uh, yes, it's a little bit tougher nowadays, but uh, overall the luxury business is still, I think, uh, in, in pretty good health. Any further questions from the floor? Okay, in that case, that concludes our luncheon dialogue. A big thanks to our speakers, Adrian Chang and Alan Lee for being with us today. Let's give them a round of applause. <laughs>